awesome. Worship was so cool, and it's so fun to be doing church again in a little bit of a church format, although it's not exactly what uh, we hope to end up with in the future. Um, we have a few people in the room, not a lot, Redemption South Africa, Redemption Holland, and Redemption wherever else you're watching, chill out. This is not church right now happening somewhere and you didn't know about it. We just have our worship team and their family and some friends, and, and there's not a lot of people here, uh, just a handful, but it gives an atmosphere of worship, and um, I'm excited. We are starting a new series, and to be honest with you, I feel it's so aligned with what God had for us because it is taking us towards the end of the year, towards the Christmas period, but it is setting us up for the new year. And uh, God always speaks to us for the new year, and I have a confident expectation of what God is taking us into. And I need to tell you this, 2021 is, is uh, let me just say this, 2020 we've spoken before is a mountain moving year. And right now some of you might still have mountains in your life, but receive that 2021 is the mountain moving year because that is what God spoke. And even in Tara and my life and um, what we've seen, we've had mountains in our life privately, we've had mountains in our life publicly, we've had the challenge of church and what's happened. But I can tell you this, as we have leaned in to the grace of God, in other words, made an intentional effort to fixate our language and our eyes and our ears on the gospel, on God's word, on God's ways, receiving communion, um, being intentional with our finance, as we've structured our life for a mountain moving year in the presence of mountains, we are seeing God move mountains. And that is what he declares on all who call this church their home. So do not let that be a promise that was for someone else. Let it be a promise for you. And if you're facing a mountain right now, how much better a promise to have than a promise that if we would not try to do it by our might, not by our power, so our own our own ability, our own strength, our own strategy, but actually by the Spirit as we speak grace, the finished work of Jesus, as we shift our confession from the natural to the supernatural, that the mountain would move in your house. And for some of you, that is something you needed to know right now. It's not just good enough for you to know text and context. You need to know that God wants to move the mountain in your life. That's what he's declared on our house on our church, on our homes, mountains will move if we would allow it to be about the spirit. Man, oh man, do we have enough flesh in the world right now. We have enough politicians, we have enough economics, we have enough science, we have enough epidemiologists and people trying to tell us what to do with viruses, what to do with economies, what to do with societies. But let me say this, that's all flesh, natural. We have to release the supernatural. We have to let it be by the Spirit. Now more than ever, the Spirit matters most. Now more than ever, doing it God's way by the gifting and by the grace and by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And it's so easy because you might say, I don't know what the Holy Spirit is saying. I can tell you right now, it will never contradict the Word of God. So there's so much in here for you to do, but just align your life with the Spirit, not the flesh, not the hurt, not the emotion, not the entitlement, not the frustration, the Spirit right? You know, what do I do about that hurt? Forgive. No, that's not how it works. That's not going to solve my problem. Yes, it will, because it's by the Spirit. When we engage the Spirit, we see the Spirit move mountains. Amen. So we are beginning a series that is so exciting for me. It is contradictory, but you'll understand why we went through it, called a pandemic of hope. Um, and why I wanted to say that is, um, it is so significant to discuss what the gospel does for people. So the word pandemic is a, is a Greek word, um, and it is, it, is, it is literally meaning on all. So of course, in the context of a disease, it literally means something that can affect all. So that is why the word being used in the media and the word being used in the description of the coronavirus is a pandemic, because the perspective from the scientific community and the medical community is that this virus can affect all, not just a part of society, but all. If it was only limited that a certain group of people could catch this virus, 
then they would not call it a pandemic because it would not mean on all. But because it is a virus that can infect all, a pandemic word is given because it literally means everyone on the earth is, is, has the possibility of catching this natural virus. And hence, a pandemic exists. But do you understand that Jesus did not die for a group of people to give a certain privileged, entitled group of people hope or a future. In fact, when Christ died, he died for all. It is the language of scripture is God sent his son for all the world to deal with all the sin so that through Christ, all who believe would be saved. All, all, all. You notice under the Joshua series, we spoke about the language being that it is God's heart that his children, all of them, follow the ark into the promised land so that all of them could occupy all of the land. In no language does God isolate a group from occupying and being a part of possessing the promised land. Of course, there is structures, there is leadership, there is movement, there is the instruction over the priesthood, the instruction over the people, the instruction over Joshua where the ark must go. But at no point in God's language does he isolate, discriminate, and leave people out. All should occupy all. And the church of Jesus Christ needs to get in its spirit and in its heart that following God never leaves you out. It looks different. Because we often see it with a, well, we only see it naturally with a limited mind. We see it in the one dimension of our experience, our thought process, our understanding. But if we would shift into the spirit world and follow the leading of the Lord and obeying his ways, we would find that, hang on a second, he doesn't isolate me. In fact, he actually releases me into what I really needed, not just what I had framed for myself, but far greater. It is literally the conversation in scripture is as you lay down your plans, pick up my plans, they're better than your plans. So it's the, it's the humbling, which is I'm not God. I don't know how. You are God. You know how. The humbling of us into trusting him that takes us into promotion, that takes us into more. So, so much of this conversation of following Jesus is that all possess all. In other words, the church of Jesus Christ does not look like a gathering of people where a certain select few benefit at the cost of all. That's not the church of Jesus. That is a pyramid scheme. That is, that is a business mindset. That, that is not Jesus. Jesus, literally in his church, Whenever someone looks from every angle, they see, they see unity amidst diversity. They see a forgiveness and a love that is not natural, that is not earned. They see a, a submission that is not earned. They see people functioning in order, not chaos, out of reverence and respect, not disrespect and everyone. But yet, it doesn't cost the group, at, uh, so that a few live in elitism. No, in fact, what's so fascinating about it is all occupy all. So we all get to be a part of it all. In other words, it's not a natural way of thinking. The natural way of thinking says that one person must win at the cost of everybody. But then we're not functioning with a supernatural way, we're functioning with a natural way. So I still believe the church to emerge as we move towards, right, the, the last days, as we move towards those, that moment before we are raptured and we start to see Scripture play out towards the end, the church of Scripture that speaks of it getting brighter and stronger, I still think is yet to emerge in its clarity. And yet I still believe it won't limit some. I still don't see a church where, where a gender is better than another, yet both function in the fullness of, of God's design, where, where we have to have honor at, at the cost of respect and getting opportunity. I still see a church where people can thrive, not at the, it doesn't require someone else to, to fail in order for me to succeed, if you know what I'm saying. And yet we still haven't really seen that emerge, but I fully believe in it. So all occupying all, it's promised land living, not natural living. That's yet how we're meant to live. Why do I say that? Because the world is meant to look at the church and go, I want in. That is thriving from all angles for all people. 
and I still believe that is what God wants for us. So we believe there might be a pandemic, a viral pandemic that has actually released an economic pandemic, a economic downturn on all, that has released an uncertainty on all, a fear on all, right? A a hopelessness on all, but actually that we will see a pandemic of supernatural hope, which I wanna describe to you today, that actually means on all who engage with the gospel, we will see a different life, a different way, a different result. I can tell you this, I have seen in our church how people this year have gone with God and supernaturally have been carried separate to circumstance, separate to situation, separate to economic, corporate. I have seen God be faithful in being a deliverer, a savior, and a prosperer of his people. And so I, even more so, what's fascinating is, you would think I believed in the word of God in 2019, but literally 2020 has been, I either live this or I go do something else. So for me, Christianity is not my culture. It's not my upbringing. It is now my faith. And that's a shift I wanna encourage you all to make because it's great that this is nice and it's friendly and it's kind and it's, it's inclusive and it's forgiving and it has opportunity and it's full of grace. But let me say this, if it's not your faith, it's not gonna get proven out. And, and, and so faith is, is in, I, I am standing right now on this stage with a faith in the structure beneath me. I, because how do you know I have faith in the structure? I'm standing on it. I have applied my belief in it by coming onto this and standing here. If I just stood on the ground and looked at the stage and said, it looks like it's nice and strong, you would say, I don't have faith in that structure because I'm refused to test it out. And so listen, if anything comes out of 2020 is that Christianity moved from a bubble for you to an air reality, then fantastic, because that's when we start to see our life move from the natural to the supernatural. So speaking about hope over the next few weeks, there's something very interesting about this, because when we started to talk about this, the conversation was, let's start with hope for ourselves, hope for our families, hope for our relationships, then maybe hope for our finances. But can I tell you where real hope lies in scripture, we're gonna look at it, is when we get a picture of the eternal picture. Because the only way you are gonna have peace for the future is to recognize what already sits in your future and how what is existing in your future is already impacting your now. So before we talk about the stuff and the things and the people and the friendships and the relationships and the cities and the lost and your calling and your destiny here on earth and your effectiveness, let's talk about the eternal picture because when you have that, it actually, let's begin with the ending in mind. God didn't say, I'm sending Jesus to the earth to see what happens. He said, he's gonna save. It was an eternal decision with an eternal effect. And you'll see that now, that's actually what drove Jesus into a, I'm, I'm excited to fulfill the will of my father because Jesus was not shown the short term, he was shown the eternal picture. All right, so we're gonna jump into a very complex book and I'll do my best. to to bring it into a simplistic narrative. But we're gonna jump into Hebrews chapter six. And actually what I wanna focus on for a moment is literally that uh, the writer of Hebrews wants to motivate believers into a space of hope, activity, and effectiveness. So the whole idea behind this conversation is speaking to people whose circumstance is difficult, because at the time that this is written, believers in Jesus are not getting contracts, they're not getting opportunities, they're not getting careers, they're getting martyred. Um, They're losing all culture, in fact, they're getting rejected by families, rejected by cities, and so Hebrews, written to Jews, right, who are now believing in Jesus, or it is the, the case is being placed before Jews, 
why Jesus is Messiah and why that matters, and if you believe in Jesus, why that's such a good thing. The case being laid is the goal here is actually that you would be effective here. So the writer of Hebrews doesn't say, listen, let's get the economy sorted out. Let's get society sorted out. Let's get government sorted out. Let's get, you know, equality sorted out. And all those things are a part of our value system. But he actually says the whole goal here is for you to get a picture of eternity so that you can be effective as long as you're alive. So we're just going to go there right now. So Hebrews chapter 6, I just want to show this to you. Um, He says in verse 9, Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Because in the first part of Hebrews chapter 6, and I don't have time to go into it, he's basically describing a group of people that have contemplated and played with the idea of by the Holy Spirit following Jesus, but they never did. So a lot of people often would preach the beginning part of Hebrews chapter 6 to say someone who believes in Jesus can lose their salvation. But the truth is, the conversation is, he starts off by saying in verse 9, but beloved, meaning people who are the family of God, that I have better things to tell you. So the conversation really in the first part of Hebrews chapter 6 is people who've never really believed in Jesus. So we often, we've got to be careful. We preach to people who believe in Jesus, what will happen to them if they don't believe in Jesus. Um, So if you don't believe in Jesus, it's not a good thing. And you can read Hebrews chapter six. It doesn't result in a fantastic, fantastic life. But the whole goal here is to show you what happens if you believe in Jesus. And to those of you who do believe in Jesus, to enforce why it's a good thing and why you can have an effective life here on earth, right? He says here, but beloved, we're confident of better things concerning you, right? All beloved, all believers. The moment you believe you're part of the beloved, right? Things that accompany what? Salvation. So this is what comes with salvation. So that moment you believe in Jesus, you are saved, but do you wanna see what comes with that? Because this is how to live an effective life here on earth. Because getting saved is fantastic. You're going to spend eternity with God. Jesus is is your sin sacrifice. He's removed all the sin that you could ever commit, past, present, and future. Getting saved is fantastic, but getting saved is the first step Yet, you still got to live a life of purpose, right? No one here wants to say, I'm saved. Now it's, let's just wait to die, right? You get saved and you get activated into a life of effectiveness, right? Possessing a promised land, living. Okay, so listen to what he says here. He says, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you, we don't desire that only Pastor Josh, that only the staff, only the leadership, only this person, only that person, only Marcel, only Mark, only Stephen, only Candace, only, you know, Anne, only this person, that person. No, he says what? That all of you, we desire what? That each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of what? Hope until the end. That you, who's you? Everybody do not become sluggish, but that everybody has the potential to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So, The goal here is there's two ways to live after you're saved, right? You could live not inheriting, sluggish, meaning apathetic, or every single person has the same opportunity to literally imitate those. Imitate means when someone sees your life, they see what they saw in somebody else's life, okay? I love golf, all right? But I do not imitate Tiger Woods on the golf course. Okay, thank God, not off the golf course, okay? But on the golf course, I don't imitate Tiger Woods. I just don't. I would love to. It would be the biggest compliment of my life that I could win a master's. Never gonna happen, all right? I don't, prote- I don't possess the potential, all right? But here, the writer of Hebrews is saying, do you know all of you possess the potential that when someone looks at your life, they would say, you imitated those who literally through faith and patience inherited the promises. This is for all, on all. 
the desire here is that every single person would literally be known by this mark. So how is it that our life gets there? What is it that brings about this shift? So then he goes on to describe, literally, God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself saying, surely, blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. Why this is a significant text in the book of Hebrews is because the greatest blessing that ever existed to the Jewish people in the history, and it is still the greatest blessing, was the blessing pronounced on Abraham by a priest. But it wasn't a natural priest, it was a supernatural priest. It was a priest that never had a birth nor a death, that never had any lineage attached to him. It was a priest greater than the priests in the law because it literally describes to us later in Hebrews that literally in Abraham's loins were the Levitical priesthood that would run the temple, but he offered up a tithe to that priest, Melchizedek, because that signifies that the natural priesthood is subject to and submitted unto the eternal priesthood. Greater than, okay? I have to keep reading here, all right? So he goes on to say, literally, God swore by no one greater. In other words, God made a declaration and a covenant and a promise on himself. He literally backed it up by himself, saying, I will blessing, I will bless you, multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise for men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation. So he goes on to describe that literally what's amazing is two things exist in verse 18, right? It is impossible for God to lie, in which it is, it is, so, it is that we would have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. So here's what he says. What's so exciting is there is something that sits for us in this revelation of this priest that declared a blessing over our father of faith, Abraham, our natural father of faith, right? And what's so awesome about this blessing is God backed it up by swearing upon himself. In other words, committing that he would test himself in this blessing, okay? And through that revelation, we would have literally strong consolation is almost too weak a statement. We would have literally a immovable, steadfast stubbornness that we literally lay a hold of as a picture of hope that sits before us. So we almost become resolute in the fact that we have hope for the future. This revelation gives us a steadfast hope for the future. And what is this hope? It is an anchor for the soul, sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. So this hope brings us into literally a holy of holies reality. You are able to live in a holy of holies from this hope, right? It enters behind the veil. Why? Because Jesus went ahead of us. And what did he become? behind the veil because a picture of the tabernacle on earth was a picture of a heavenly tabernacle, literally written a chapter later in Hebrews, that what you see there, what you see here is a picture of what you see there, which is why we must never get confused and think it's all different. There is a systematic patterned approach that makes sense because it points us in a direction that's very exciting, right? And it hinges around this high priest in heaven, literally Jesus, right? who as a picture here on earth in Abraham's time appeared as Melchizedek, right? So what's so fascinating about this is it tells us that he literally starts to function in a role or he is functioning in a role that the more we get a revelation of that reality, the more we start to have a revelation in this reality that is literally a holy of holy living. So, to the world, when they look at you, they will say, you have a surety and actually a hope. The word there for hope in the Greek is the word elpis. Now, I want to say why this is significant. 
is it has two variations. It can be used in two different ways. So the word alpis literally means an, an expectation of. But in one word, in one way, you can use it to say bad. And in another word, you can say good. In one word, you can say damnation, like I'm going to be destroyed. And in the other, you can say salvation. The world cannot sleep through the night, cannot look to the next decade. They can't figure out where to live, where to reside, where to set up their families, in which currency to put your savings, which career to bank upon. Oh, we've got disruption happening. I used to be good at this, but is that going to disappear for disruption? Is this going to be replaced by robots? Is that going to be replaced by, you know? Do you get what I'm trying to say? An absolute uncertainty of security for the future. In fact, they have an out piece of damnation. You know what? This whole thing's going to go finished, right? Fear. We can literally have an absolute expectation of salvation, right? Through this revelation. So in chapter 7, verse 1, he starts to describe this high priest. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed Abraham, right? To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness. So this is what Melchizedek literally means. So we have Melchizedek, king of Salem, as written in Genesis chapter 14. Uh, almost you could say thousands of years before this was written, almost. Like it's, it's not written the day before. So you look at the pattern of God and this is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to highlight. It all fixates on Jesus, but not just Jesus as our sacrifice on the cross, but Jesus as our reigning high priest, right? Raised from the dead, returned to heaven, reigning as high priest, functioning in an office for us today, okay? So he says, first part of Melchizedek is translated king of righteousness, and then Salem is peace. So you have king of righteousness and peace, which we know describes Christ literally, right? He then goes on to say, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, made like the son of God remains a priest continually. So he is functioning as priest right now. How, consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed those who are the sons of Levi at the, at the time of writing of Hebrews, he's saying those who right now are alive as the Levitical priesthood functioning in a church right now who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive the tithes from the people according to the law that is from their brethren. And though they have come forth from the loin of Abraham, but those, but he whose geneal genealogy is not derived from them, he being Jesus receives the tithe, uh, he being Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. So he's literally saying here that even as right now, temple is functioning, people are bringing tithes to a person whose genealogy is tied back to Abraham. But the truth is actually now in the new covenant, when we tithe, we don't tithe to an earthly person. We are literally tithing to Jesus. Why? Because he is still functioning in the office of priest. Now, here's where it's cool. Why is it so important he's a priest? Because the priest is the mediator between humanity and divinity. The priest is responsible to make things right so that the blessing that sits in divinity, because divinity for, uh, I can't get too, too philosophical, for God to be life, not death, blessing, not cursing, he can only give one thing. So whenever you access him, right, you, <laughs> and you get him, right, you're going to get one of two things. You either are not going to qualify. In other words, 
His holiness will expose your sinfulness, in which case that's literally described as death, right? But, but to get him in his character, the priest literally gives you access. So a good priest all throughout the Old Testament meant a good nation. If the priest was alive doing his job well, the nation thrived. Good priest, great life. So it was not who's Pharaoh, it was not who's Caesar. The thinking was a good priest. And so when you look at all the significant moves of God in the Old Testament on behalf of the nation of Israel, the priesthood is in a good place. That is why God commands Joshua to tell the priests to engage the ark and cross the Jordan. If the priesthood were a mess, it would have gone bad. But because the priesthood went first and did what they could do because the people couldn't pick up the ark, the people couldn't perform certain, because why? The people were still not worthy of engaging because of their fallen nature. So you need a priest because the priest is the connection to the blessing of God. No Melchizedek, no blessing, I will bless you, multiply you, I will multiply. So why this is such a big deal to make a big deal about Melchizedek is because anyone who understood what took place here goes, I want that, the blessing of Abraham. In fact, <laughs> here's the thing, we need to change our language from the blessing of Abraham to the blessing put on Abraham, because Abraham did not possess the blessing. The blessing came through Abraham's obedience, but it was possessed by Melchizedek. So Abraham didn't show up with blessing. Melchizedek showed up with blessing. And what was in Melchizedek's hands? Right? Wine and bread. What was in Abraham's hands? A tithe. We still see that today. We come with the body and the blood of Jesus the priesthood is to offer you the work of Jesus and your response is the, the literal work of your hands and the two speak a supernatural blessing and a multiplication that comes from heaven. Why is it so significant? Because here's the deal. As long as you're on earth, you will need two things. Your, your whole hope, your whole future, your whole outlook is dependent on am I gonna have protection from disease, from sickness, from people, from attack, from enemies, and provision. That's literally what you need on earth, right? That is what we call a blessing, protection, provision, right? That is what Melchizedek, aka Jesus, has in bucket loads, right? Because it is all of God. Nothing of God dies. Nothing of God withers. Nothing of God goes goes into any lack and suffering. So we need this mediator still. And he functions in that because a great priest literally means God is pleased with his people. If you came with, the, with, with, with hundreds of years of sin, hundreds of years of mess to a good priest and you said, my mess is now in your hands, Right, literally, you came with your sacrifice, your animal, and you came to your priest and you said, listen, you have no idea what I've done. You have no idea what a mess my life is. You have no idea what I've created. And you said, but here is my innocent animal, but the innocent animal is part of the exchange. The other part is a priest that prepares and goes through the process that is worthy of accessing behind the veil. The blood has to go behind the veil. So the priest needs to access God on your behalf with your sacrifice. So look at the work of this Melchizedek who is not only himself the sacrifice, but himself the priest. Why is that important? Because God needed a covenant that man couldn't mess up. So Christ is himself the sacrifice and himself the highest priest because the most secure thing you can have is God swears on God. Right? So here's the thing, how do we look ahead? Because you know who is ahead? Who goes before us? Our high priest. Now, 
it's not good enough to say Jesus goes ahead of us because you could say, yeah, but he died then. What is the purpose of him going ahead? Because he died for your sin, but he is now working for your provision and your protection. So you could say, but my salvation was great, but I need other things. No, these are the things accompanying salvation so that you now can get activated into effectiveness. Because what good are you, sick, down, discouraged? And I'm not saying if you're facing sickness, you've messed up. I'm saying God wants you living a life activated, imitating those who literally lived in faith and productivity, okay? So as he starts to unpack this, he starts to quote from the Psalms and he literally comes back saying, what's so amazing in verse, like for example, um, yeah, check this out, okay? He goes on to say in verse 14, um, for it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah of the tribe Moses, which spoke nothing concerning the priesthood, and yet it is far more evident that if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, now he goes on to quote literally the Psalms, Psalm 110, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, describing the Lord to come, right? For on one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, not saying that the Ten Commandments are weak. It's why is it weak, right? For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So the revelation of Jesus draws us closer to God, whereas the revelation of the law tells us, you don't qualify, right? You can't come close. And in as much as he was not made a priest without an oath, for they become priests with an oath, but he was an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. In other words, when we had a good priest, if he died, you didn't have a good priest anymore, right? It's, it's the, the issue of life on this earth is it's only as good as the person can be in the moment that exists. So you can't have an eternal hope if your faith is placed in a natural man. And the problem with the nation of Israel is there are, if you go check out your history, times where there's a fantastic high priest, he dies and his son takes over and he's, his son's an idiot, and literally everything goes pear-shaped, right? And so this was a real problem, okay? So he goes on to say here, um, but he being Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. No one will ever remove Jesus from the office of priest on behalf of believers. Those who believe in him, he will be their priest. For how long? Forever. Now this starts to get awesome. Because then he goes on to say, therefore, he is also able to do what? Save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now, we talk about Jesus interceding for us, praying for us. That's exactly what it's describing. But you know, you know prayer can be, I don't want to say this, but some prayer can be frivolous, right? Not all prayer gets answered. For example, God, you know, oh, uh, I, I, let's be foolish, you know, God let Man United win a, a game, all right? That's frivolous prayer for me right now, okay? The thing is, some prayer has no part in the plan and the will of God. And why I say that, I mean, in this context, human prayer can miss it. You can pray for the wrong stuff, you can pray. So the interesting thing is, he has this stuff. A high priest is our go-between, okay? So why it was necessary to have a high priest is a person would bring a need or 
a desire or an answer or a, a move. God's blessing needs to invade the situation. Forgive, work, move. And they would bring a sacrifice. Now, the interesting thing is the priest's role was to take the sacrifice and perfect it so that by the time it made its way onto the altar, it was pleasing to God, a sweet-smelling aroma. And the beauty of the sacrificial offering was that God never said through the priesthood, only this type of animal would cut it. So it was all literally about where a person was in their life. If a person was struggling and poor and going through a lot, then literally they could catch something like a dove or a pigeon and bring it to the priesthood. If someone was wealthy, right, a sacrificial offering for them was a big bull. But here's the thing. Anyone could bring something that was a sacrifice for them to the high priest. So when a poor person brought a pigeon, how many of you know pigeons are not pretty animals? To a large, I'm not saying anything about the life of pigeons. Don't kill pigeons, don't do whatever, okay? I'm just saying it's not a pretty, doves are nice, pigeons touch and go, okay? But, but if they brought a wounded, listen, what type of pigeon can you catch? Probably a wounded one, hopping around, okay? Well, that would be the pigeon I would try catch, okay? But you'd come to a high priest with your, with your pigeon, for example, his responsibility was to take it and prepare it and perfect it, to remove your mess from it so that the moment it made its way to the altar and it was burned, it was a pleasing perfume. Why it's so interesting is the writer of Hebrews is describing to the Jews what they understand but he's describing Jesus as a role in heaven. And this language for intercession is so interesting because you can pray. I don't know if you've ever been in a church service and you've been like, Jesus, I got distracted. I'm thinking right now you're sitting at home or you're sitting in a room or you're watching and you're thinking about this and about that and about what is Pastor Josh wearing and what's going on and, what's, and you're getting distracted. And then the thought comes to your mind, oh, I'm not being holy. I, I'm in the house of God and I'm not even paying attention. Have you ever been singing? And you, I, I've got to be honest with you. Kneeling is not my thing. If I'm kneeling, my body's telling me this hurts, this is pain. I'm not thinking I'm closer to God. I'm not thinking this is amazing. And I'm thinking I'm supposed to be holy. This is supposed to be a, 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 a spiritual moment. But all I can think about is how my kneecaps are not made to be kneed on. <laughs> so, so the very act of being in the house of God is still exposing how imperfect my worship is. All right? But what's so amazing is Jesus' is high priest making intercession is that Greek word there is entenchamo. Now I want to explain to you why that's so powerful. Because we will always have our fallen nature, but our hope is that our high priest working on our behalf is preparing what we bring, perfecting it so that when it hits God, all of flesh, all of man, all of brokenness is removed. And even when you pray, so the word there for intercession, entenchamo, has a Greek meaning. Now the word for sin in Greek is called hamartia. Literally in English means missing the mark. God has a plan for you, a target, a standard for you. You have a potential, but when you sin, you miss your potential. You literally live to a lower life, okay? And what's so incredible is when it is described that Jesus makes intercession for us, he's not standing in heaven just going and praying remotely, right, random prayers, right? Praying for our car, praying for others, praying for our tires, praying for our water bill, praying for... No, he's not functioning like that. The high priest is far greater than the natural needs of man. He is connecting the divine, right, to the to the humanity. So his prayer there, Enten Chamo, literally translated as he intercedes for us, it is that Greek word, Enten Chamo, directly translated to English is the word hitting the mark. As you pray, see the key part here is we have to see him as our answer. Because it says all who go in verse 25, he is able to save all who access heaven through him. Here's where we miss it. 
we don't involve Jesus. We don't involve Jesus in anything. So communion is literally bringing him in. You know, but pastor, I took communion last week and I'm still feeling, take communion as often as is necessary. With our son Jonathan's uh, seizures, we just started taking communion all the time. Yes, there's medicine. Yes, there's call a doctor. Yes, there's hospitals. But we took communion because we had to involve the work of Jesus. And here's the thing, with your finance, involve Jesus. It is literally written here, he testifies that he lives. As we, in fact, in Hebrews chapter eight, I don't have time to get on, but if you keep reading, it literally says it is important that he has something to offer. Why? Because what you're demonstrating to the world and what you're involving is heaven in your natural circumstance, in your protection, right? Communion, literally, and your provision, tithe. But here's the thing. It gives us a hope that moves us from sluggishness lack of potential to a steadfast, positive expectation of this life on earth as we see him working as our eternal high priest, right? He is able to save to the uttermost every single person who comes to God through him. Why? Because as he always lives, he is helping us hit the mark. This is what's so cool. Verse 26. You know how much God loves you? Check this out. For such a high priest was fitting for us. I mean, if you don't feel loved right now, God said, I can't just give you any high priest. I have to give myself as your high priest. Why? He is holy, harmless, undefiled, right? Separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens who doesn't need daily as those high priests in the past who offered sacrifices. No, he first for his own sins and for the people's sins. This is the high priest in the human temple. No, Jesus for this, he did once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests, men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the Lord, the Spirit, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. God looked down upon his children and he said, I have to give you the best because I want you to be declared holy, undefiled, worthy of blessing, worthy of all the promises I made. I have to make you that, therefore I gave you myself as your priest. Not only is God our God, not only was God our sacrifice for our sin, God is our working high priest. Provided we go to God through Jesus, it is blessing upon blessing, multiplication upon multiplication. So why I'm saying that is, before we go into productivity, we must first bring the work of Jesus into a reality in our lives personally. We have to order our homes, our perspective, our lives around the work of Jesus. Because as we do that, what happens? We start to come into a productive, flourishing, imit listen, I don't care what you say today. I don't wanna be known as the guy who was a good investor like Buffett, the guy who was a good like this. If you say to someone, that Joshua McCauley reminds me of in scripture where they describe that apostle, that disciple, if I imitate those who in faith change the world, greatest accomplishment ever. And you know what? That is a promise for each and every single person. All, all beloved have the potential to walk a life like this. So when we come to Jesus, right? Our goal is to get to God, but we have to go through Him. In other words, bring it to Him. All who came to Jesus as their solution got what they needed and more. The leper didn't just get healed, he got a hug, right? It wasn't just about, it wasn't just about saving the woman caught in adultery from the punishment of adultery. It was about releasing her into a life without sin, you know, without brokenness, saying, go from this, grow from this, be a different person from this. 
Everything we bring to Jesus and submit to Him, I promise you on the other side of that obedience, it's better than you could have done in your own strength. Even if people decide to leave you, abandon you, speak about you, criticize you, turn their back on you, submit that to Jesus and see the people He sends on the other side. See the people that enter your life on the other side. It, it, it makes such a big deal. It makes such a significant moment of going. All it really is, is keep coming back to where eternal hope sits. And let me say to you, Jesus died for our sin, but He reigns as Melchizedek for our righteousness. He literally, that's what's coming our way. Every time we receive communion, we're reminded of our healing, our righteousness, our redemption by Jesus. Every time we trust God with our tithe, we are reminding ourselves and our circumstance, He is my provider, right? Hope for eternity, right? Begins and ends with Jesus in eternity as our Melchizedek, working as high priest for us. I'll go between all the time. See, the devil tells us, this is what's so, this is like the crux of his lie is when he opens our eyes to our weakness or to our, our instability or to our circumstantial mess, right? Do you know what he leaves out? That you have a go-between. He says, what's God gonna do about this? Well, how's God gonna bless this? How's God gonna fix this? How's God gonna deal with this? Because you start going, well, that's true because I don't know how to get God to fix this because it's a mess. No, you bring it to the fixer. Your go-between is the person who's responsible to then take over. So, so your, the real battle is just submitting it to the Lord and then going, now Jesus, lead me and guide me. What are we gonna do here, right? But fixing it is not your responsibility. He is your go-between. He is your high priest. You come to a high priest and you go, my goodness, this is an ugly pigeon, but it's all I could catch. High priest says, that's fine. It's my responsibility to make it a beautiful, sweet smelling aroma so that God would pour out his blessing and move and act so that you will hit the mark. So what does it do? It just stops us from bringing things to Christ and submitting them unto him, surrendering them unto him. And we try to fix it ourselves. You know, I have such a faith for what God's gonna do through the church. I, I, for me, quite frankly, I really have an expectation that the best days are ahead. I really sense it. But I feel that for us to walk in fruitfulness, we have to first engage Jesus in our homes, in our lives, in a way that sets us up, that our high priest is working for us. Save to the uttermost. <laughs> the Bible doesn't even say to save. It's to save to the uttermost. In other words, to take what is dead and make it thrive. That is what happens when we make Jesus our go-between, when we go through Him. So right now, wherever you're watching, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in other words, you've never ever said yes to Jesus. I'm not asking you about church attendance. I'm not even asking if you understand Scripture. I'm asking you, do you sense right now in you this Jesus died for you and that this very blessing and this life that we're speaking about is something that you inside are going, that's what I've been missing. That's what I need. That's what I want. This grace of God, the goodness of God, right? That He died to give you. Christ died to give you God's grace, God's righteousness, right? That, that is received by simply recognizing and saying, yes, that's for me. So we wanna lead you in a prayer wherever you're watching around the world, in whichever language you are watching, Pray with me this prayer that Scripture says, that God Himself says, opens the door for Christ to save you and your life will never be the same again. Pray with us. This is your moment. The Bible says to every person there is an appointed time and I don't believe you're watching this by mistake. You are watching this today because God wants to save you now. Pray with us. All you have to do is just repeat after me. Say these words, say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me by your blood that was shed, your body that was broken, all my sin, past, present and future has been washed away. 
Today I declare, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time in your life, right now we want to celebrate with you. Would you please just let us know by either emailing the address below or going to our website and saying, I pray that prayer for the first time. If you're watching in social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, wherever this is reaching you, if you prayed that prayer with me right now, would you just comment below and say, I prayed. We want to celebrate with you and we want to send you a whole bunch of resource telling you about Jesus and what He means to you. We are so excited for what God has done in your life and we can't wait to see how your life turns out now that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And wherever you're watching right now, we are gonna receive communion. If you can in your homes, wherever you are, go get some bread and some juice. <laughs> now you understand how significant this moment is and why it should be for all. All who believe in Jesus should be doing this as often as is necessary because why? We are bringing the healing and the wholeness into our world. What Jesus has done, we are bringing it into our reality. So if you can, just grab some bread, a wafer, a cracker, wherever you're watching right now, we're gonna to receive together. Gather your family around you. If you're alone, gather with us. If you have a family member that's ill somewhere, let's place them under this covenant. Let's speak this life over them because why? If they believe in Jesus, this is for them. We, we so want this to be a moment of faith, not tradition, but transformation. So if you can just take this bread in your hands and repeat after me, say the body of Jesus was broken for me. Every stripe, every stroke placed on His body was for every sickness. I receive a healing diagnosis in my life today. Thank you, Jesus, for healing in my body, in my family, in my home, in Jesus' name. Now we break this and we eat it together and we receive literally like we would medicine, healing into our homes. I wanna speak right now as well to people dealing with emotional brokenness. When you recognize that God makes perfect all that is broken that is brought to Him, what you need to do is give it to God. Don't even try to figure it out. Don't even try and plan and plot it out, but literally give it to God. And I don't mean give it to God as a mess. Give it to God with an expectation that He will work. So that's what we're gonna do right now. Why? Because the blood of Jesus saved you and washed you clean of all sin and therefore placed you in a position to receive righteousness and function from favour. So as we receive this, we're not just saying Jesus died for my sin in the past or even the sin of the future. We're also saying the blood of Jesus was shed to do what? to order my life under the favor and righteousness of God. And I might not know how to figure it out, but I will receive the end time prognosis that God works all things together for good. So right now, as we take this juice, we say the blood of Jesus shed for me, declares me righteous, pleasing, and whole. Thank you, Jesus. You are working on my behalf. We receive and Father, we declare every single person at home partaking together with us today walks in the favor and the blessing placed on Abraham. In Jesus' name. Thanks so much for tuning in. I pray that today's word blessed and touched you. Let us know if you experienced something, if something happened on the inside. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to hear the testimony of how God used us to impact you. Until we see you again, stay safe, be blessed, and know that grace is greater than any obstacle you face. From us at Redemption Church, have an incredible day.